Jamie, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to speak today. Um, and as you said, I'm going to take you through the, com uh, the content approach to commerce and share some of my experiences at a, a company called Brompton. Um, we make falling bicycles. I would have brought mine uh, here today, but I wanted to arrive sweat free, so I've refrained from bringing it in. Um, but to start with, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about how I actually ended up at Brompton, because it's kind of defined uh, how I've approached content over time. I spent the first six years of my career working in the automotive industry in a B2B company. It was fairly dry. Our most exciting products were sandpaper. It got a little bit tedious, and so I was looking sort of for the next challenge. And I was very lucky uh, to find myself in my first e-commerce role here, Party Central. And uh, I was tasked with growing Jack Wills online in the USA. And I really thought at this point, I had life nailed. It was all about uh, sort of beaches, parties, living the brand lifestyle, an endless summer, and a seemingly uh, endless stream of content that really resonated with the audience out in America. Um, and it helped drive uh, acquisition for the brand um, and also set eventually sales. Um, but behind the, the, sort of the, the storytelling, behind the parties, um, we also wanted to tell more about the product. And we started testing uh, how we would sell um, the product via stories rather than just being very much traditional e-commerce focus, but actually start about uh, engaging uh, people and selling stories. And uh, there was one really interesting encounter that I observed uh, in one of our stores in, uh, in Connecticut. And um, it was a, a store associate who upsold uh, a customer from a $100 blazer to a $500 blazer on the background of just telling this really simple story about how, believe it or not, Jack Wills actually owned a flock of sheep in the UK um, and we were able to follow the manufacturing process from shearing through the spinning, dyeing, and then eventually the, the garment fabrication. And this person absolutely lapped it up. They couldn't hand over their $500 fast enough. And so maybe really realized what we could do online. And we actually spent a lot of time um, talking about not just the brand and our brand ambassadors and the great time they were having, but also about the product, the product quality. Um, and it seemed to really work. Um, and uh, it became a real focus of the business about how we deliver this content um, and not uh, actually via um, a lot of advertising, but just mainly on site and how people went through that content journey um, to actually buy the products at the end of the day. Unfortunately, um, all good parties must come to an end. And uh, after uh, speaking to Jack Wills, I found myself um, here, an interesting place. Um, and I took on a much more sort of commercial trading role uh, with the QAT based company Al Shire, uh, specifically trading women's underwear online under the Lucenza brand. Um, a sentence that gets me into trouble quite often when I refer to it. Um, it was a really dynamic trading environment, and we worked closely with stores um, and our parent company in the USA. However, it soon became pretty apparent that it was really a content void. Um, we were launching new collections every three weeks um, and with no real stories to support them, as the slightly lightweight copy here might show. And uh, it really became uh, all about pr price at the end of the day. There was a lot of online competition and we were working hard to try and clear through a lot of the stock. So um, unfortunately, it was really a race to the bottom. Um, and the messaging that we could put out was slightly confusing for the customer. We were pushing bundles, we were pushing mix and matches. There were offers, combos, three for five, five for five at one point, and even a 10 for 10 offer, which was not particularly commercial, but it definitely got some sales through. Um, and uh, I sort of got a bit fatigued by this and realized that I really missed the content side of things. I really missed telling those stories. Um, and uh, I kind of, although there was some depth to, 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 to what they were trying to do as the brand, um, they really lacked any substance, a bit like some of the underwear. Um, and uh, so I was approached by a role at uh, a company called uh, Brompton, uh, a British manufacturer, and I tried to find out more about them, and uh, I couldn't find anything really online. There was some sort of hygiene content about sort of legal requirements and um, how you could get to your nearest store if your product had had a problem, but it seems to be entirely focused on someone who had already bought the product, unlike someone like me who was prospecting the brand, not only to work for them, but also I was thinking about buying them, uh, buying a Brompton, as I was a keen commuting cyclist at the time. Um, and so I was really intrigued. So I decided to take the interview, mainly to find out what on earth they were doing, because I just couldn't understand uh, why I couldn't find out more information. And uh, this is what I found.
So I was pretty pleasantly surprised to see what I found. And uh, I was actually having spent a lot of time in factories as part of my automotive background to actually see something that was kind of sexy. It actually made manufacturing look good and interesting. Um, and this wasn't the only story that Brompton had to tell. Um, and uh, despite the fact they are made in London, there were just many stories that they had as a, as a company that, that they just never really decided to share, never really decided to tell. Um, a couple of them uh, I thought I'd mention are the fact that uh, potentially we invented crowdfunding. Back in 1975, when Andrew Ritchie, our inventor and founder, couldn't get the product going, couldn't get anyone to buy in. Um, and some of these letters actually show a rejection letters from Raleigh, who were the biggest bike company at the time in the UK, and also a couple of banks who said, you know what, you're crazy. This is never going to work. This is never going to happen. Um, and uh, they rejected him. So he reached out to his friends and said, you know what, if you give me some money, I'll make a bike for you that you can have and take away. Um, and this is back in 1975. And, and it, Believe it or not, his friends actually bought into it. He was obviously a good salesman because his friends bought into it and funded the project effectively. Uh, they got their bikes and his company got, got, got started, started to take shape. Um, there are other stories as well. So for example, you're much more likely to change your car before you change your Brompton because they're handmade. They're, they're really good bits of kit. And so um, you might be in your three-year financing package with your car, but actually a Brompton can last for 10, 15, and in some cases, 25 years. And so having spent a bit of time with the company, I couldn't just couldn't really understand why they'd never told these stories. They were so compelling, it was such rich content, especially coming from the void that I'd just been in. Um, it was really, uh, I couldn't believe uh, that uh, they hadn't decided to share these stories at all. And the reason why um, really revolves about the company's evolution. So a quick history of Brompton. From 1976 to 2005, it was all about the product. Andrew, our inventor, was really focused on making the product. He was obsessive about it, uh, so much so that the original Brompton actually ended up in a skip because he hated the look of it. He couldn't bear to look at it. It was so imperfect to his high demands, uh, high standards, that he threw it away, which in hindsight is, is a bit of an error and it's definitely lacking from our museum. But it was all about sort of small manufacturing um, and getting, getting, a, sort of, uh, getting the, the product absolutely right first. The next phase, uh, a few decades later, um, was all about going global. And as the brand became more successful, um, we started taking orders from around the world, with the, the most bizarre order actually coming from the South Pole, where someone wanted it to, to get around the, the research stations and get out to the various equipment um, out there. I think it's quite weather dependent. Um, but we started to export, and, uh, and now we actually, actually export to 48 countries around the world. Um, but all of this was done without any real marketing. And as our first attempts at brochures show, we were probably better at building bikes at that point than actually talking about them. Uh, the reason why we hadn't gone to marketing, or hadn't turned to marketing, it turns out, is that uh, we were very lucky that our um, demand outstripped our ability to supply. We were still based in a really small factory and really unable to, to meet the global demand for this fantastic product. Um, and any marketing we did do really just sold disappointment. You get this idea of we c you can make a custom bike, you can have it in different colors, different setup, different handlebars, different number of gears, but it might take 12 to 18 weeks to actually arrive at your doorstep. And therefore, as a proposition for the customer, um, especially with sort of growing demands, that wasn't going to wash. And so we actually tried to avoid marketing. However, fortunately, a lot of this changed in 2014 when we introduced a line approach to manufacturing and enabled our, our, our production capacity to actually outstrip demand. So it was definitely time at this point we thought, right, marketing is going to play a key role in the company. We better talk to some customers. But. Being a small British manufacturer over the years that had no real marketing pedigree, our brand and content had been left in the hands of our distributors and dealers for a really long time, perhaps too long. And that meant that in some places around the world, we were known as Brompton, made for canal boats, perfect for boating. Uh, in Japan, we were known as Brompton, made for middle-aged Japanese men who like to spend an awful lot of money on the most premium Brompton product they can find, but only ever ride it at the weekends and never in the rain. And then there's also this guy, Brompton, made for the guy who likes to sit at Waterloo, reading his paper, waiting for his train back in the 1980s. Uh, so much so that people still today think that you have to travel by train to own a Brompton. Um, so maybe it was successful. Um, so we knew that creating a platform to tell the real brand story uh, was something that was really, really key for the business. And we went about defining uh, what the brand story really existed of. And we came up with this idea of made for cities. The Brompton really comes alive in the city. 
It's also made for you, so you can customize it. We actually have up to 16 million different combinations you can spec when you order your Brompton, which does get slightly overwhelming for some consumers. And the final story, which is the one that, I, that really sort of caught me, was made in London. These bikes are still made in London today, and not just putting the stickers on, they're actually made. They're actually, I open my office door, and there's a guy with fire in his hand and metal making stuff, which is pretty exciting, and again, an absolute content treasure trove. So it was pretty key that we needed to tell the story first, um, and digital was going to be the only platform to do this. But we also realized that there was a, a much greater story outside of the brand that, that people would resonate with. And this, this, that was, the, and this was the idea that Brompton could make uh, city living better. We wanted to help people move around cities, and so we wanted to tell the story that this is really a product with a purpose. Now, despite the fact that I was really keen when I joined the company to practice my newfound trading skills with women's underwear, um, we had to deliver this global brand me message, and there wasn't really the opportunity to, to start with commerce. Um, we had zero competence in being a direct-to-consumer business at that point, um, and what it takes to manage uh, those kind of B2C relationships. And similar to Heather's business, we also had the potential for a lot of channel conflict, as we only sell our products through third-party retailers, um, counting 1,600 doors around the world. Um, so we had to be quite careful and trade quite careful. Um, um, so we started uh, with the help of a UX agency called Web Credible, and we embarked on a, a six-month research project to really understand what content did we need, what, what user journey, what digital journey um, could we find out um, that would really help people move them from uh, just being informational and very informational website designed for owners to making it much more aligned to prospects. And we did a lot of testing, a lot of tweaking, um, a lot of going back and throwing things out and starting to complete from scratch to define the best content experience uh, and then finally build it out on a new CMS platform. And one of the critical things was getting the platform right. So we had this beautiful experience. We just test, very well tested. We were about to share it with the world, but we needed to get the right platform. And uh, especially because we ship to 48 countries around the world, we actually export 80% of the 50,000 bikes a year that we make. So getting it right in other markets was definitely a really key thing for us. Um, and so we decided to go with a platform called Sitecore, um, mainly for the ability to translate and roll out transla tra translations very quickly, but also to try and, uh, and convey that, uh, or use the tools that come within Sitecore um, that are in inherent, which allows you to, in real time, adjust the content to your audience requirements. Um, so, for example, these are two different shots of our, our current homepage. Um, the one on the left is aligned to our 300,000 uh, Brompton owners around the world, and we have many of those people um, registered, or we can track their behavior to, to identify them as an owner. And so we actually serve them content that, that might be relevant to them, in this case, taking part in our global series of racing events, of Brompton owner racing events um, around the world. Whereas if you're a new prospect coming to the site for the first time, we probably don't want to give the impression that this is what Brompton ownership is about. Um, and actually, it's much more this sort of idea, this is more day in the life about how potentially, in this case in Berlin, um, a Brompton might benefit you to get around the city. Um, and that's at the point where you get to understand the brand in a bit more detail. It's much less daunting. Um, and then hopefully when you buy your Brompton, you get to sort of uh, engage in some of the more quirky sides of, of Brompton ownership. So one of the things we did realize as we built this lovely content journey out is that we wanted to help transform the business. We wanted to make it much more relevant to consumers, um, but we couldn't be transactional. And as I think has been mentioned a couple of times before, without having the transaction, without owning the transaction, it can be incredibly difficult to get funding, to get support, um, and, and actually to, to help to uh, invest in the content that's needed to, to drive transactions. So we went about building a, a conversion funnel, uh, building this customer experience, and trying to align it to some of the key uh, business um, KPIs. Um, in this case, it was actually really inspired from our time uh, researching and being in store, whereby people would come into store as they do to the website, they browse around, they interact with content, they potentially show a bit of intent as to what they might want to do next. We then actually pushed them to one of our major tools on our website, which is our Bike Builder. This is the ability that talks you through um, the various options we have and allows you to build a bike. But most importantly, you can save that bike, you can take it to store and order it, um, and uh, by doing that, you give us an email address. You've got a bit of an inkling as to who you are at that, at that point. Um, and each year, uh, we get about 75,000 people. For the 50,000 bikes that we actually sell, we get 75,000 people who come online and build a bike. 
Then there's trial. Again, we don't sell the bikes directly, we don't ship direct to consumers, so we're very much reliant on our partner network um, and our find a store functionality to drive people into the store. All of our dealers have Bromptons uh, to trial, so we're trying to push people into those stores to get the best experience. They sort of overcome the preconceptions that if it folds, it won't be very strong. Um, will I look like a clown riding a circus bike? All these kind of things get, get overcome, hopefully, when they go and visit a store. And uh, through that journey in store, they then also purchase it from one of our third party retailers. So we actually lose sight of them at that point, but we encourage them to come back and register the bike online once they've purchased it. And we're trying to push this through our dealer network to make sure that we are adding real reasons, real value for people to come back and register. The first one is warranty, and not in kind of the white goodsy, no offense if there's one from white goods industry, um, kind of way where it's extend your warranty for two more years, you must register the product with us. But it's much more in a, in a way that we have a bike that we've been developing for the last 40 years that actually we send out retrofitable upgrades to every six months. So by not registering it, by not getting your warranty information, by not communicating with the brand, you're missing out on a bunch of updates that actually make the bike a lot better. I kind of say it's the equivalent of turning off your iOS notifications. They send you, Apple send you something better every six months um, and you do have to kind of pay for it. Um, and with Brompton, we keep on trying to send out new, better products to our consumers to make their bike even better. Um, and then there's the ownership experience, something that we had massively ignored as a company. We were just happy to sell bikes to dealers who sold it onto the customers. And we hadn't really thought about the needs, the wanting of Brompton owners. And if you've ever met a Brompton owner, they like talking about their bike. Uh, and uh, they want to talk about it, they want to have a community, they want to have a sense of engagement. And we hadn't catered for this at all in the journey. Um, and so as we started to build this journey out and started to link it to actually an on-site funnel, in this case, uh, help me choose functionality. So guiding the customer through uh, the decision-making process, whittling down 16 million options into the, the right product for them, um, and actually getting them through that to a goal where they could then go into a store, feeling a bit more empowered and having some product knowledge. And, Bike shops generally can be quite daunting experiences. Um, and so actually going there, having had the research, being, feeling quite empowered with the information, we started to show some business results. Um, and as we built this out, we started actually to uh, see the information out across the company. And there was a real job to do actually about educating the company about some of the digital metrics um, that, we, uh, that, we, that we talk about. Being a manufacturing company, being an engineering based, appropriate for this building, we love data, which is, good, which is a good start. To be able to, to, to talk about this and show the value of actually pushing people through the funnel was really important. And the critical thing was actually having people register their bikes. At that point, we can match up people who had built bikes via their email address and saved it, and then people actually got on to buy the bike. And there's some really interesting insights uh, that we learned from there. And again, quite similar to, to, to Heather's business, we could look at things like the life cycle the, 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 and, and the time taken to complete those purchases. But, as we grew and we started to push websites out, we ended up with a, a bit of a content headache. Um, and being a small team um, and being based in the UK, we realized that we actually had to try and transform um, a lot of our distributors and third parties who still had some of the websites up there. Um, here are a few examples. Hopefully you can spot the, the, the real one from the imposters um, in terms of how the brand was being presented online internationally. And by telling our dealers and distributors and the consumer that there was a better experience available, we suddenly had demand from around the world for people to tell the local stories, tell the content, and it became quite a challenge to say no to people that they couldn't have the new website, that we were trying to work through a local language translation for them. But also one of the critical things was we were struggling to generate local content that was relevant for each market, and so we actually turned to social to try and stimulate this for us. And it became a much more cost-effective option than sending a video crew or a photo crew out around the world to our key cities. Again, bear in mind we export 80% of our bikes um, overseas. So as opposed to sending um, people out there to take the content for us, we just reached out to our customer base and prospect base. And so we started a series of, sort of local content curation um, made for escaping, which is kind of one of our brand promises. It's not just for the city, you can use it to escape the city. Generated, you know, 600 posts and some great content that we could pull into the website for particular markets around the world as part of a live feed. On the other hand, you've got made for cities, which is predominantly dominated by Brompton. 
um, on the hashtag, but it was fantastic to see how people were interpreting Brompton in different areas around the world. And this is content that we packaged up and served out um, on the website um, and then also across our own social channels. We became quite lazy, actually, when it, came to, when it comes to social because we were regramming and reposting and retweeting about 90% of the content because it was so good and so organic, um, sorry, so authentic, um, that it was much easier to do that than try and get sort of a staged photo shoot and push that through ourselves. As well as trying to manipulate some of the content locally of our social for our own needs, we actually went out there and tried to understand what people were using the bikes for, using bikes for in cities, and then shared that content globally as well through a competition called My Unseen City that ended up being so successful that it actually went from an Instagram competition to a physical exhibition that we housed um, in our, uh, our own store in the UK, where we, uh, I think it was featured in Time Out, and so we had about 250 people coming through the door to look at a physical Instagram e um, exhibition. Um, and it was just really a nice testament that the content was that strong, people were prepared to come and look at it offline. So things were progressing nicely, and we were building up this content, being able to localize, and it overcome some of the challenges of operating six individual sites around the world. Um, but there was still the one thing lacking, still trying to get closer to uh, a, a business model whereby we could say we were really contributing, we were really delivering ROI for the business, and getting that featured um, at a board level to generate more funding to extend the experience out to different countries. So we looked at how we could generate value from the content. Um, this is our bike builder, particularly quirky model that I decided to build uh, a couple of days ago. And um, people doing this actually gives really good insight into what the potential color demand is by country. Bear in mind that some of our dealers and distributors, especially those in Asia, are placing orders for product six months in advance then having it shipped out there by sea. So they might have been ordering product that was totally in, uh, sort of going against the trends or color trends uh, in a particular marketplace. So by taking some of the data from around the world, we're actually able to turn it into value and give that back to our dealers and distributors to allow them to make better buying decisions when it comes to the product. The other one that we found really interesting was around uh, the find by store, the deal locator. And again, we have 1,600 um, stores around the world that you can buy Bronson from, um, which are all third-party retailers. But it was really interesting to see actually where the demand was coming from, where people were building bikes. And building a bike, it's not that a straightforward a process. It shows quite a lot of you know, time, consideration, purchase intent. And so we can start to match up and see where the demand was coming from versus where we actually had physical coverage. And we provided this data back to our dealers and distributors to allow them to look at activating stores in different parts of different cities or different regions where we actually saw demand from. So and this has become a really interesting part of the business now where our dealers and distributors are coming to us desperate, hungry for this information. And there's a, a, a wealth of information from our website being derived from the content, which is making them make, make better business decisions. We also decided to have some fun with the data too. Um, and this is a, uh, a sort of a living, breathing bit of content on our website. And it basically maps out um, members of the Brompton Club on Strava, which is an activity uh, tracking app. And it shows the equivalent CO2 they've saved by taking their Brompton on their journey versus taking other forms of transport, a blended rate of emissions from other transport. And so this gets updated in real time. Every time you log an activity on Strava, it updates this map. And every year we put a big call out to our customers on the sort of global cycle to work day to try and beat the previous year's record. But it was really fun to see this sort of living and breathing. And it really resonated with customers who were uh, thinking they were sort of doing something good, something positive for the environment. They were able to change the, the, the way their city behaved. And we were visualizing that online um, in, in, in real time. So that takes us to the present day at Brompton. Um, we've built this um, experience uh, and, uh, and built the brand out uh, across the world. And we've got uh, these translated websites, we've got six and still counting. Um, and we're also adding this sort of local level user generated content to provide a really nice flavor. Um, we've used a CMS platform to tailor the experience um, to different markets, but also to edit the content people see in real time to make sure they're getting the best experience on site. And we're not scaring them off with pictures of crazy people um, cycling around in Bromptons. And I just want to share one example of how we're using this actually in Amsterdam, which is a really tough city for us to break because they are cycling already. They, they're in and out cycling. They absolutely love it. Um, and so we're trying to show um, the cycling market in Amsterdam, particularly why we're relevant to them.
So particularly in Amsterdam, there's this idea of being able to move around the city, being able to interact with the ferry or the tram and different forms of transport, using the product actually way much more for socializing than maybe in the UK and London, where it's much more of a commuter tool. Um, but the most in interesting for us was the fact that actually in Amsterdam, you can get your bike stolen, even though there's so many of them, uh, the bike security is a real issue. But also, bizarre enough, you can get your bike locked to other bikes, and then basically other people lock their bikes to that, and you can never get your bike out. So you might lose a bike by having it locked in. So they've got a bike parking problem in Amsterdam. And so some of those shots are around the fact that you're Brompton, you keep it with you, uh, you don't have to lock it up and therefore potentially lose it. Um, so of all this, we've done some really good insights as well to be able to pass on to, to local markets um, and help our dealers and distributors. Um, and we've got, again, a really good appreciation now for what content works and how we're driving people through that funnel slowly towards purchase. So it kind of feels like we're probably at about time to monetize this. So the good news is, finally, content is, is coming. And it's been a real challenge to try and drive it through, to get the, again, another sort of, uh, thing I relate to with, with Heather's business, at board level, to understand it. it's daunting, it's scary, involves potential channel conflicts, involves being prepared to engage with our consumers. Um, but we're in a position to actually, uh, now having built out this content platform, having really invested in the customer experience, to start to think about actually engaging and selling bikes to customers. Um, we've got this opportunity to monetize the 300,000 people that already own the bike, which is a really nice captive audience to have. And we add 50,000 new owners a year. Um, so making sure those people are engaged with the brand is really, really key to us. We've decided to launch uh, e-commerce with our first product launch for the last 40 years, our first major product launch, um, which is actually the Electric Brompton, which is coming out later this year. And the reason for doing that is to really get that sort of proximity to it. We, it's a really important product launch for us. It's not going to uh, sort of be uh, global to start with. It's quite a small sort of beta rollout and then getting the feedback because it is a big change for us. But we decided that we had to go on the commerce approach, direct to consumer, to get that instant feedback. We can't rely on our dealer and distributor network to get secondhand information about what is probably going to be the most important important product launch that we that we ever do. So um, it's really key that we can build that, uh, that transaction, build that trust with customers by being um, commercial with them. We're also, uh, interestingly enough, doing some stuff in China as well, where um, the market has really forced us to, be, um, to go online to sell direct. We have four physical stores that we sell through in China. China is a big place. And so we realize we can't expect customers in this day and age, um, especially Chinese customers who are so digitally enabled, uh, to come to our physical stores. So that's a really interesting marketplace where we're hopefully going to increase our reach, increase conversion, um, and we've got the ability to ship direct to the consumer there. So that's pretty much it. Uh, just wrap up on some key lessons that, that, that we've found uh, at Bromson on the, the content to commerce journey. We've been very lucky that being privately owned, we've been able to build the brand first. And it was definitely something that I took away from my experience at Vicenza was the fact that it's so much easier to ask for the conversion, ask for the transaction, once someone's really engaged with the brand, once you've been able to tell them a story. The other key thing is find the right platform to achieve scale. And we're very lucky that we've been able to scale pretty quickly over the last two years, rolling out six international websites. Although we have 20, of the 48 countries, we, have, we actually serve up 26 different price lists, and every one of our 60 million combinations could have an individual price. So the back end is pretty comprehensive. Being able, being able to serve that in a really nice uh, front end format has done us a lot of favors. The other key learning for us is that short, the social can be a great shortcut. It'd be great to give that local flavor um, and bring that into the website. It's definitely enabled us to be much more relevant in more markets around the world. The other thing that's been a real bonus is that we've been able to, to find value in the content, be able to derive value from that and pass it on to our trade partners. And that's why when it comes to the idea of channel conflict, it's going to be a lot easier for us to have some of these conversations when we start to sell more direct to our customer's customer, engage our customer customers more when you're offering them insights in return that can help their existing bricks and mortar business. And finally, the other one's been patience. Despite my sort of desperation to drag us into sort of the commerce world, it's actually been really good that we have been able to prolong it to build the experience uh, first. And now that we've got that, uh, commerce will hopefully become uh, a lot more natural to us. Thank you very much. Thank you.